Hey everyone, welcome to another edition of the Skyhook Podcast. My name is James K, and before we get into the rest of this episode that I'm very excited about, just wanted to give you a quick heads up because Chris and I recorded a conversation last week about, you know, just kind of going over Courtney Vandersloot's MVP case and some of the other storylines going on in Chicago at the time. But right when we were going to post it, um, and I'm sure you guys have heard about it, and I hope you care enough to keep up with these kind of problems that we're dealing with in America right now. But Jacob Blake from Kenosha, Wisconsin, um, he became another victim of police brutality. And um, we don't have to go into that right now necessarily, but we didn't want to release any content out of respect for him and those who've been traumatized by this ongoing problem in America. If you want to, I want to lightly put it that way, I should say. Um, but you know, the timing of that incident paired with Azure Stevens and Diamond to Shields being declared out for the season, um, it made it difficult for us to release this episode as it was edited. So yeah, I'm taking the time right now to talk about some of the things that have gone down in Skytown at the top of this. And then Chris and I um, are going to talk a little bit about this, the Slooty 2020 MVP case and all that still fresh content since that doesn't really deter anything that of what we were talked about in that episode like nothing over the past week has made it difficult for us to release that as it was so that'll still feel fresh but you know there are a couple things that went down skytown last week that i wanted to address um last night Courtney vandersloot set a WNBA record for most assists in a single game with 18 assists i mean the last person to even ditch 16 assists in a WNBA game was Tisha Ponchero in 2002. I mean, it's incredible what she continues to do. And again, I won't step on the conversation that Chris and I had, but I really feel like this guy needed a moment like this after losing Stevens and the Shields for the season. Because while Sloot's historic night is both remarkable for what she did on the court, and, you know, she's also donating $10 for every assist she has this season um, to CPS. So, there's more meaning behind what she's doing outside of us being in awe of her carving out an even bigger place in WNBA history. Um, and again, we should celebrate this a hundred percent. It's incredible to see how she's still able to evolve 10 years into this, you know, her playing career in the WNBA. I mean, it's just amazing to see what she's been able to do, but at the same time, I mean, there's this lasting sting of not having Diamond and Azure for the playoffs, and that hurts. I mean, there was a potential timetable for the Sky to get through these last few games of the regular season without necessarily having to completely unleash Diamond, who was only playing 17.2 minutes per game before, you know, she returned, like, before she left the bubble at, for personal reasons, um... And, you know, Azure too, I mean, they feel like they didn't necessarily need to be playing her 25, 28 minutes a game um, right before the playoffs. And so, I mean, there was this time, like there was this timeline of maybe having both of those two players back fully healthy, or at least at 80, 90, 95% before the sky entered the playoffs. Um, so with that in mind, I mean, with both of them out, the road to the finals is a little bit more murky and you could kind of feel how the team was a little bit deflated against the storm when they found out that morning that they were going to be with, without diamond and Azrae the rest of the way. And they did bounce back against the fever. And again, the having salute, having another record setting performance. Um, I just, it kind of reminded me of her triple double becoming, you know, she, that performance back in 2018 when she became the seventh WNBA player to record a triple double it was uh it had that kind of energy and you know but going back to the sky um i mean this team will still obviously make the playoffs you know vandersloot simply raises any team ceiling i know this is a ceilingless team um that's been the mantra the entire season but she does raise any team ceiling um especially when you look at the bottom of the league right now but this season was about winning a championship and that goes beyond coach speak and by that I just mean how every team even if you're the Liberty wings or any you know across all sports you just see any team that even has such a 
destitute outlook, they will still say we're playing for a championship. Um, some teams being more overt about it than others, but like this team, it wasn't coach speak to just say that this was a team ready to win a championship. You know, I mean, this team when it's fully healthy could run out 10 players and I feel like a lot of people felt confident in what all those players can bring to the table on a minute to minute basis. And I think that a lot of people going into the season two thought that diamond to shields was going to have a breakout season. Some of us thought that it was going to happen last season, but hey, this was year three. This is when it typically happens. And, you know, diamond was kind of derailed by injuries. Um, as Ray was looking like the steal of the off season in terms of trades. And then you, I mean, then, even the players that were still with this guy, I mean, Gabby, Kalia, I mean, they, I, I think it's pretty obvious to say that they outplayed the expectations people had on them heading into the season. Ruthie Hebert has provided valuable minutes off the bench, and James Wade, I mean, he started her against the fever. I mean, he clearly has trust in her in a way that he, I mean, at least last season, he didn't see it in. The rookies that were, um, you know, that were on the roster, and Chloe Jackson and Katie Lou Samuelson. Um, so, you combine what the players brought to the table this season with James Wade in his ability to mix and match different pieces until he finds something that works. And I mean, we should talk about him for a second too. I mean, James Wade is just so—he's just so brilliant, man. Like even beyond like what he is able to do on the court as you know, the reigning coach of the year and arguably could have been the coach of the year this year. Um, to, I mean, and maybe it could still happen depending on if the sky, you know, end up as the two seed. Um, when you hear him at these press conferences, and I know it sounds a little bit cheesy, but um, I mean, the poise that he has to just go up and tell people about his experience dealing with racism and his value as a black person in this country to, and you know, he's able to do this despite the pain you can hear in his voice. I mean, I mean, that is just something you can, you can really get behind a person like that in any situation, whether that's basketball or in life. And, um, you know, he's an incredible human being. And I mean, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, when you put all of this together, like that formula of having the depth that this team has with the brilliance of James Wade and his leadership on and off the court, we're talking about a championship team here, you know? Um, and unfortunately, these injuries really, I hate to keep using the word derailed, but I mean, these injuries derailed that path for the sky to get to the finals. And anything, anything can happen, you know? Anything can happen in the playoffs, but it's going to be even more of a fight than it was going to be before losing Diamond and Azure, just with how great the top five teams in the league are this year. But for right now, Chicago's fan base should just focus on what Salute was able to do last night against the Fever. It, Again, what she's been able to do this season has been incredible. Chris and I are going to talk about it right now for the rest of the episode. And again, I just think that it was a really fun conversation to have because it's really tough at the top for this MVP race. But without stepping on it even more, um, here's the rest of the episode. And thanks for listening to the intro. Chris, how are you doing on this late Tuesday night? Okay, James. Um, you know, things not the way that they should be, and I guess they never really are, but <laughs> doing all right, man. Just listening to the cicadas chime, uh, chime twilight. Oh, my God. Last season, I had the worst time recording in uh, the second floor of my parents house um that's where i would do my recordings last season and the cicadas oh my god they ruined so many recordings where i've had to i spent hours just trying to edit it out and so yeah no man i feel that i uh i resent them so much after that me and the cicadas aren't <laughs> on the same page anymore because we clearly were before um no man but i mean we have a lot to talk about today you know, there's a lot of buzz in skytown whether courtney vandersloot should win the mvp we've got a couple of games we can go over from last week as well. Um, Azure and Diamond have suffered injuries. So, I mean, that's pretty much what's on the docket today. And let's just start with the positive, though, Chris. I mean, there's a lot to be happy about in Skytown. Right now, they're playing the Liberty, but right now they are they stand at 10-4. and four. Um, They 
are within a game of the Storm at the top of the WNBA standings. And the Storm, I don't know what happened last week, man, but Storm didn't look that great, um, couldn't beat the Fever. And right now they look a little bit vulnerable. I'm sure that there will be a correction there. But let's start off with Sloop for MVP because she has made a really strong case. Right now, as it stands, again, only 14 games into the season, would you have Sloot for MVP? It would be hard for me. Um, it w- I, I love what she's done. And I think she's top three in MVP voting. It would, it would be hard for me only because I know if you take her off the sky, they're, mid, they're middle of the pack because they don't have a point guard who can do what she, do, never, to, to do what she does, never mind a, an individual player who can do all of the things that she does together. They would be a competitive team. But if you take her off the team completely for an entire season, they would lose some direction. It would somebody would have to pick up the slack, and I think it would have to be two or three people to kind of fill in the gaps that Courtney Vandersloot does. But she's certainly gathering steam. That 15, 6, and 15 game was incredible. Um, I would still – I would be hard-pressed to take it away from Asia Wilson mm-hmm. at this point because, man, the Aces are going to have to figure out what they want to do because when one of their two post players is on the floor – they are a locomotive and when both of them are on the floor together they don't get going as well so all that is to say that asia wilson has flourished while liz cambage has been out which is so unfair to liz Mm -hmm. but she just has they they play in each other's space in a way that's not conducive to their ultimate success so that aside asia's been playing great she is a mid-range back-to-the-basket player in an era where basketball is moving towards easy layups and three-point shots, and she is near indefensible unless you play her the way that Chicago did the other day. And I would put her right now as the MVP. I think she's been a top-flight player in this league for uh, two years now at least, possibly three, and she's been mounting an MVP campaign so far. Nafisa Collier is one of my favorite players to watch. And she is holding Minnesota up. So I can understand that people have her as the MVP. But you know what? You talk to me tomorrow, and I probably put Sloot over either of those two. You talk to me the next day, and it's going to change. So it depends on what we have Mm -hmm. the last few week games of the season. I do want to talk about Asia Wilson in a second. But I want to discuss the Seattle Storm first because I've seen on Twitter people bring up Alicia Clark in the MVP conversation and, and Jewel Lloyd and Brianna Stewart as well. Um, you see a lot of big publications right now putting Brianna Stewart at the top of the conversation, which, I mean, she, it's a no brainer. Um, I get it. I can't argue with the logic that the best player on the best team should win the MVP. But if the, this, this is my case against the Seattle storm, like anyone on the Seattle storm winning MVP this year. And I don't know how strongly I feel about this yet, but this is just like when we were preparing for the episode, this is how I felt about it. If you took Stewie off that team, it still leaves Jordan Canada, Sammy Whitcomb, Natasha Howard, Mercedes Russell, Ezzy, Stu Bird. Um, and then you, again, you have Clark and Jewel Lloyd. I mean, right now their team has three of the top players in net rating and Clark Lloyd and Stewart. Obviously, Stewie is the engine of the offense. And again, she's putting up crazy numbers. But there is a part of me that doesn't want to, like, reward the award to a team that is stupidly loaded on offense and possibly would have been in this position anyway if she wasn't ready to come back. And again, that's just one case I could make against any player on the Seattle Storm. And to be clear, I would be 100% okay why, if she were to receive the award, if she gets it. But I look at what Asia Wilson and Courtney Vandersloot are doing right now. And if one of them wills their team to the two seed, I would be way more inclined to give it to one of them because you can't take either of them off the court without the Aces or Sky losing a little bit of steam. And to be honest with you, I kind of think Vandersloot fits that last statement to a greater degree. And like you said, the Sky don't have a player like her who can keep the offense going. And and the reason that is kind of the case is just because the Sky don't – I mean, they were supposed to rely on Diamond to Shields much more heavily this year, and she hasn't been able to play more than 18 minutes a game 
And the injuries, I mean, the, the injury bug has gone around. Steph Dolson and Cheyenne Parker have dealt with their injuries. Um, now Azra, this is her first game that, that she's going to miss, um, and hopefully she'll be back soon. We'll get to that later. But, um, I mean, the team has had to rely on Ruthie Hebert a little bit more. And, and again, Ruthie's looked great, but, you know, she's still a rookie. She's trying to figure out how to navigate the WNBA in a season that is just so out of whack. And one of the things that I feel like has been lost in the conversation is that the Aces had an entire training camp to figure out how they were going to make things work without, without Kelsey Plum or Liz Cambage. While I feel like the sky are kind of doing this on the spot, man. Like they, you know, it was announced in the season opener that Diamond had a lower body injury and that she's going to be on restricted minutes. That caught everybody off guard. Steph Dolson hurt her ankle in training camp, still able to make the season opener, but um, missed the next seven games. And, you know, she's a huge part of the offense. I don't know. If, I mean, I feel like the Sky are still, like, I feel like that is something that's just been lost because um, they didn't have that two-week period. Like, the Aces had to figure – figure everything out. And that's my Courtney Vandersloot MVP case. It's just, if we're going to reward this award to the most valuable player on a playoff team, and that's how it usually goes down. It's hard for me not to pick Courtney Vandersloot just based on all those things that I just outlined. And that's only if you share the same mindset, but you get what I mean? You know, it, the question is always, what does most valuable mean? Does mm -hmm. it mean most valuable to the team? Does it mean the absolute best player in the league doesn't mean most valuable to the league, you know, mm -hmm. the, what, what does it actually mean? This question has been parried around for, for years. And there's a, a famous NBA pundit who wrote in a book of his that the league likes that they like people to keep having that discussion because it means that they never have to define MVP. So they never have to uh, really defend their choice for MVP. And that goes the same for writers. So it's, I think that perspective uh, kind of clears why we have the discussion like this and why we can have a discussion like this without any one person being right or wrong. Mm -hmm. Who's most valuable to their team out of the three that we mentioned? At this point in time with Sylvia Fowles out, it's Nafisa Collier for sure. Although Crystal, Crystal Dangerfield has made her case for rookie of the year very clear um, Brianna Stewart is probably the best player in the league, though she's had a couple of tough games back to back, as we've seen. Um, and Asia Wilson is the top flight player in the league. Liz Cambage is out, so she's the focal point of their offense and, to be fair, their defense as well. And Courtney Vandersloot is the engine for the sky. Even when she was an 11 and 6 player, she was the engine for the sky. Now she's, getting, she's around 16 and 9 and a half. And she's always going to be the, the player that makes Chicago go. We've talked about, if not on this pod, we've talked about in just in our discussions how much worse they are when she's not on the floor. They've been better recently, but they still lose a lot when she's not um, in uniform or when she's just off the court resting. So you could make cases for any one of those players given given that particular criteria how uh, how valuable are they to the team who's the best player in the league i think it's brianna stewart who's most valuable to the league in terms of like generating money they've chosen to focus a lot of marketing around brianna stewart and why wouldn't they she's four-time most outstanding player of the ncaa tournament she's already a, is it a two-time mvp or she's just won one mvp she's won at one mvp so far okay i think she was gunning for she was people were looking at her for a second and then she had the achilles injury it's first of many <laughs> right <laughs> we're, we're going to, we're just going to go ahead and, and pencil that in she's going to win at least two she's yeah. going to win at least two awards <laughs> And so what a lot of times is going to happen is that MVP is going to come to the person who is deserving, but maybe not the best or most valuable, but people are kind of tired of staring and focusing and focusing and staring at one person who they know is the best, mm -hmm. which is what happened to a lot of uh, great basketball players and might happen this year. If that means Courtney Vandersloot wins, I'm not upset about it. The Sky are in the best position that they've been as a franchise ever. Even the year they went to the finals, they were 15 and 21. And it was very clearly without Elena Della Dunn on the floor, they were a much worse team. 
And she missed a lot of time that season. She won the MVP and they went to the finals and they got swept out of there by Phoenix. They have a chance to get to the finals, win a couple games and possibly win the whole thing. And that's with the injuries that they have right now, which we're going to talk about. I just want to say before we move on, though, that I don't think that Salute would win this just because of like a narrative um, that's being thrown out there just because of what she's doing this season. And after a 15-6 and 15 game that people – are looking at other people who are saying that Vandersloot should be the MVP, that they're pointing at that. I can, that's from what I've seen, just people being like, this, like um, don't get too attached to the narrative of it. But, I mean, what she's doing statistically is insane. And I think Sloot is backing this up with her numbers too, you know. I mean, she would be the 13th or 14th player in WNBA history to have a 50-40-90 season. Um, and that depends on if Sydney Weiss continues her stretch and, you know, she's playing less minutes than Sloot. Sloot's playing the sixth most amount of minutes in the WNBA this season. She has, again, those, these numbers are going to be different once the Liberty game's over because she'll probably have 90 assists while we speak. But, like, she has 113 assists, which leads the league by so much. I mean, Jordan Cannon is second with 69. 113 to 69 man like that is that's insane like she should she really just opens up this offense in a way that other guards in this league just don't look at the last four years you know this is she'll have the second best stretch in WNBA history in terms of a four-year span of total assists trailing her previous mark from 2015 to 2019 where she had I think something crazy like she had over 1100 assists from 2015 to 2019 like we're witnessing history here, you know, and I know that we don't want to get too caught up in that when we talk, when we look at the MVP race, because again, sometimes that can kind of put up a, a false filter of what we think greatness is. But I mean, she's been undervalued for years and for, I, I just don't want to go to this, like go through a phase right now where we acknowledge that she's been underrated and then do an overcorrection where she doesn't win the MVP because we uh, get, yeah I know what you mean you know it's like you you rate someone so low that they become overrated right which is insane in this case you know like people keep talking online about her defensive ability and how the reason she can't win MVP is because front court players are able to eliminate shots at the rim or eliminate those opportunities they're able to get they're they're able to juice up their stat line in the defensive end in ways that guards just can't. Which, so, yeah, sorry, sorry. So no, people no, are saying that that she can't win MVP because of that because she doesn't have a lot of blocks, basically. So they were saying that it's likely that she won't win because of because people think that she's a minus on the defensive end, which is also kind of ridiculous if you consider how her offense and her being able to keep the offense steady and you know, not turn the ball over as much as they normally do. I mean, also her assist to turnover ratio would be the third best in WNBA history. So, I mean, she's also taking care of the ball better than she did um, in previous years. But also just that when she keeps the offense steady, that also they're not fucked on the defensive end after that. You know what I mean? Like they are able to set up and they're able to get back in position because of what she's able to do on the offensive end. So I don't, I really resent that argument that just because – She doesn't have like the greatest defensive numbers um, that she is now disqualified for the most valuable player award. Like, give me a break. I can, I can understand it to some degree. And Slute is not the greatest on ball defender. I think we know that even without having access to um, advanced metrics or I know you have synergy. I don't know how far back the synergy stats would go for her defensive metrics, but she's not the best on ball defender. She's playing, I think a lot better. I think the system on the whole for the sky is a lot better for all of their players, especially the backcourt. Mm-hmm. But I, to say that she's DQ'd because her defensive numbers are a bit low is a reach for me. I, I know that Brianna Stewart is a really, really good, really capable defender. I know that Asia Wilson is a solid defender, especially in the front court. I know that um, Nafisa Collier is a front court player. So it's going to, I get what they're saying in terms of like rebounds, but if you, if you kind of combine things into like a, a shot, it's basically shot attempts created points, created points, generated points per possession. I know if you look into that, Courtney Vandersloot's going to be near the top of the ratings. To disqualify her in that sense, 
is pretty silly to me. Yeah. I, the one thing I think that you would, if you would, if, if she was leading the sky in scoring and assists, that would be troublesome because I don't think that they would be doing as good. Another thing that same writer said is that only one team I think ever went to the finals or won the finals and had their point guard leading them in scoring. And that's one. because that's because a point guard is, is supposed to distribute, you know, your proto, your prototypically your point guard is supposed to give other players the chance to get better. So she could be in at the top, but she's not leading the team in scoring. Like that's, that's been Kalia Copper all season. So I, I went off, I went a bit off topic, but I just, no, you're I right, can't though. be cue her because of defense. I love defense, but I can't, take her out of the conversation because her defense isn't as good as people who have more chances for blocks and rebounds. So if we're going to give this award to the best two-way player in the league and just completely disqualify what salute does for the Chicago sky and, or just not give it to a player with quote unquote paltry defensive numbers, which she doesn't have by the way, then I think we have to open this conversation up to Candace Parker as well, who we haven't even talked about yet. I mean, she's probably going to win defensive player of the year this year if she doesn't get MVP. And Collier and Wilson have also put up really strong defensive numbers as well. But I think we start doing this thing where we weigh one player's offensive skill set over their defensive skill set or vice versa, but don't necessarily use the same logic when we talk or excuse me, when we look at other candidates for the award, like we assign these caveats to specific players, but not use them across the board when we assess MVP candidates, which just makes this process even more messy. You know what I mean? No, I get what you're saying. Like you're going to kind of put handicaps on some people that you might not apply to others um, in, a, in an effort to either disqualify them or just kind of, what's the word? water down their case disqualify i guess is the best really the best way to put it really i i again i wouldn't i wouldn't go with that argument i think what she does is is integral to into, integral to the team success which goes on both ends she's not going to get gaudy defensive numbers she's not going to average one and a half or one block a game she's not going to average one or two steals a game she's just not but the fact that she makes the team better and is also very cognizant of controlling the game is very key. When we've, we've seen Courtney Vanderson make big mistakes, you know, we, 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 watched, we all watched, watched the Las Vegas game, so we've seen it happen. She's not infallible. But she controls the flow of the game as, as well or, or better than any player in the league yeah especially especially on the offensive end and basically going from defense to offense just converts and it's she makes everybody look for those angles i think some of the turnovers this guy might have made this uh, this guy made this year might have been as a result of thinking they could make the same passes yeah <laughs> because they're trying to make some passes in space that are real iffy i want to be like sloot man i want to be like sloot um <laughs> No, I, mean, I think that's actually a really interesting point. But I mean, what all of what you're saying right now, too, is also just the eye test. You know, that is something that I feel goes a little bit undervalued in these award races, like across all sports, you know, like people when they were ragging on Mike Trout all those years ago, and they said that, you know, he's on a, um, you know, like a 500 team that didn't make the playoffs. Um, I don't think a lot of those people were staying up till 930 or 1030 Eastern time to really watch what was going on and like and that I mean you can he was disqualified because people aren't actually watching him I think that's kind of the same case when it comes to Sloot a little bit here man like when you watch her she does things I would agree with that that she does things that don't show up on the stat line and maybe that's not sexy for award winners or vote um, award voters you know like you want to see a juiced up stat line where you see someone like Asia Wilson go off for like 35 points against the Liberty I get why that is tantalizing, but at the same time, we should award basketball players for making their teams better. And to me, that's actually what the MVP comes down to. Like, if, if you remove that player from the team, how do they perform? Dude, with Azure being injured, with Diamond being injured, with Steph being out, I can't imagine this team being more than 
like a seven or eight seed, man. Like that's really like if you just take Courtney, let's just say she opted out of the season. This is a competitive ass league this year, and it's really hard for me to see this team without having their general being able to again keep the offense moving. Something that they really missed with both Steph, um, like with Steph being out, but also like anytime they take out Sloot. To me, I I just if you watch the games, you just know that that player is the MVP. I'm sorry. Like, so without, so without question, you are saying that the most valuable player is the most, is the one who makes their team the, is the one who makes their team the best. And without them on the floor, they are the, they are the worst possible version of themselves. In a sense. Yes. I mean, I would phrase it differently. I just think that being indispensable for your team should be one of the core traits for someone winning MVP, like across, and I, th- I believe that across all sports. I mean, that's the logic I have used to lead the way for my opinion being shaped when it comes to these awards. But again, that's why it does come down to subjectivity, and it's why the conversation is fun because it can go in all these different directions that no one is really constrained by any certain criteria necessarily. And I can't fault anyone, like again, any of the voters who have who have a say in this this year I, I can't fault them for voting for anyone outside of salute um but that's just how i viewed this award and i do i think being indispensable is something that is kind of in a way subjective but when you look at it and especially when and especially in this case this year you look at salute and you just if you watch her game in and game out she is the most indispensable player on the floor for all these teams in my opinion and there are other aspects of this as well of why I would vote for her if I had a vote. One thing I didn't get to mention in my article for Winsider, she's also like third in the league in effective field goal percentage uh, for players that play more than 28 minutes a game. Um, she's also hitting 60% of her spot up opportunities, which is something that she was only, uh, I think last season she was hovering around 43%. Um, yeah, so, she was. She was not good in those particular opportunities, a lot of which were coming like beyond the three point line too. Right. So I'm just saying that like, you know, she's, she's evolved. She's kept her team when they've been banged. Like again, like you have this mix of narratives, advanced stats, um, the eye test to really make us like, to me, the one of the strongest cases you can make for MVP this year um, is for her. And I, and I know that we, cover this team, you know, in a way we are, we are not covering the aces game in and game out. I get that. But like, I just think there's a really strong case. And again, my own view, and again, I'm just saying this from like the way that I view the award, it's just really difficult to not give it to her. Um, but I would also understand why Candace Parker, Asia Wilson, Brianna Stewart, or anyone else who's in the conversation, um, who, are, who are, you know, who end up in the top four, obviously, that's something that any MVP kind of needs in this scenario. Um, I, I would get it. I just think that she's still not getting the credit she deserves, but um, I don't know. Do you want to move on to the next thing? I feel like we could talk about Courtney Vandersloot's greatness for like hours. <laughs> no, I think we can. Uh, there's, there's, there, there's such a long conversation to be had with that. It's, um, Hey, I'm good with keep. Hey, it's hard to put it in perspective. It, <laughs> no, no, it's not even that. It's just it's hard to put it into perspective completely how good she's been. Like how much, not only how good, how much better she's been since uh, from last year too. Which when she, which is when she was great. She led the league in assists for the it was the third straight season. Fresh my memory. I'm getting old. Can you say that again? Was the last year that was she led the league in assists for the third straight season or the that second? That would be the third. Year? Yeah, that was the third okay. straight year. All right, so like she was so good that year, and now she's shooting better. She's shooting more often. She's hitting more shots. She's got, I think, the same or more assists at this moment. So yeah, we could talk about it for days. That concludes the portion of the conversation Chris and I had about Courtney Vandersloot's 2020 MVP case. But yeah, the rest of it I'm not going to use because it was a little bit outdated by the time we're releasing it now but thank you for tuning into this edition of the show if you want to reach out to us you can always do so by emailing our mailbag which is the skyhook mailbag at gmail.com or you can follow us on twitter at our handle at skyhookin which is s-k-y-h-o-o-k-i-n and 
If you could take the time to rate and review the show, we would really appreciate it. Right now it's available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. And yeah, thanks for taking the time to listen to the show, and until next time. 